The chief long-term consequence of Alexander's conquest was the creation of a new world order featuring political division, but with cultural unity. Alexander's successors carved out new kingdoms and Hellenized enough of their new subjects so as to create the conditions which allowed Greek culture to spread as far east as India. Taken as a whole, the period from Alexander's death in 323 until the Battle of Actium in 31 BCE is known as the Hellenistic period. Hellenistic means Greek-like, and it is an apt descriptor for a period during which many non-Greek peoples were heavily influenced by the influx of Greek settlers and had to adapt some of their ways in order to survive and thrive in a post-Persian world. Here we will examine the process of Hellenization and then tour the world built by Alexander's successors. In 323 BCE, Alexander the Great died shortly after returning from his last campaign in India. At that time, Alexander was only about 33 years old, and he had not taken much provision to make sure that he had a viable heir available in the event of his death. Luckily, he did have a pregnant wife, and a few weeks after his death, she gave birth to a male son who became Alexander IV. However, neither the empire's problems nor the ambitions of Alexander's many generals would wait for the infant to grow to manhood. They saw the death of Alexander and the ascension of an infant as opportunity for themselves. Many of these men were ambitious aristocrats, and they thought that they were perfectly capable of running the empire in their own right. And so, the regent Perdiccas, who was entrusted with governing while Alexander IV came of age, failed to keep the peace, and within a couple of years, the successors were fighting a long series of wars. For the next 40 years, the men who had campaigned alongside of Alexander in his legendary campaigns would now face each other. For some 40 years, this would be the state of affairs, and the wars of the successors would feature some very wild turns of fortune. There were some instances, several in fact, where entire armies would simply look across the field, think about their chances of winning or losing, and decide to defect in mass to another successor. Because of this, the territories in the early days of the successors varied wildly. However, by 280 or so, most of the original major players were dead, and their sons and grandsons were thinking more of hanging on to what they had and being content with that. It was already abundantly clear that no one would ever be able to gain the upper hand because a sort of balance of power had broken out, and so at this time, the surviving contenders decided to build up their new states. Even before this, Greek settlers had created cities in the east, but now they would more proactively begin to Hellenize the east more fully, which of course raises the question of exactly what it means to Hellenize the east. Simply put, Hellenization is the process of spreading Greek culture by encouraging non-Greeks to live as Greeks in order to gain advantage. The way that this would work is that the Hellenistic rulers would encourage Greek and Macedonian settlers to come to the east by the thousands, create new cities for them where they would then be allotted land and wealth and political power, and in order for non-Greeks to participate in the overall power structure of a kingdom, they themselves would have to learn the Greek language and participate in Greek culture in order to work shoulder to shoulder with their new Greek overlords. So ambitious local elites would be more likely to Hellenize than people who had no political ambition. So many of the new officials of the Hellenistic kingdoms were not necessarily Greek by birth, but culturally speaking, they effectively became Greek. They, I guess you could say, converted to Greek culture. And to help these people convert to Greek culture, to help them Hellenize, a simplified version of the Attic dialect was developed called Koine. Koine was simply easier to learn. It had fewer idioms. It was grammatically more straightforward and regular. And because of that, if you were someone who grew up speaking another language and you learned this as an adult, it would be much easier to master. So this took off, and many native-born Greeks would also begin speaking this during the Hellenistic period. 
Koine was considered easy enough to learn that, in fact, the New Testament is written in Koine for that very reason and because it was the shared language of the East. So if you were an educated person from any given culture in the Hellenistic East, one of the languages you would know so that you could participate in government and large-scale business would be Koine Greek. As for Greeks and other Hellenized people, they could travel very easily from urban center to urban center across the Hellenistic world, whether they were in mainland Greece with the traditional polis, or whether they were in some new settlement as far afield as Bactria, which is basically modern Afghanistan, they could communicate with others and find their way around the city without feeling lost. They could also conduct business in any one of these kingdoms fairly easily because they knew the basic culture and how to communicate with people. And because so many of the political arrangements were largely unchanged from the Achaemenid Persian era, and because Greek cultural and diplomatic norms were now spread throughout all of these various successor states, it was actually possible for even high-ranking officials to defect from one kingdom and then get a job in another kingdom. And they wouldn't really have to retrain or learn anything new because each one of these kingdoms was largely run the same way. So, not only could random craftsmen move around and find new opportunities, but even high-ranking finance ministers or generals could move all around the world now and find work. In a way, the Hellenistic period was a period of sort of proto-globalization. Just globalization in a scale that only affects the Eastern Mediterranean all the way to what is now Pakistan and India. But in many ways, that's kind of what it was. And the equivalent of Koine in today's world, of course, would be English. So, in some ways, there are a lot of parallels between the Hellenistic period and the modern globalized economy. Before we get into the newly founded kingdoms of the East and all of the Hellenization that took place there, let's first begin by looking at the home territories of the Greeks and see how those evolved. I think it's fitting to begin in Macedon, where Alexander got his start. The home territory that Philip and Alexander had built into a world power did not really change very much geographically or institutionally. The army remained more or less completely unchanged, and in fact it became a pattern that every other army around the world would copy, at least in the Greek East. The most significant early ruler of Hellenistic Macedon was King Cassander. He began by killing Alexander IV before he could come of age, an act which was universally condemned, but secretly praised by all of the successors who were glad to have Alexander IV out of the way. Cassander then declared himself king of Macedon in 305, ruling until his death in 297. He founded two major cities. He founded what he intended to be a capital city at Cassandria, which is at the same site as the old city of Potidaea, which was itself a major battlefield in the Peloponnesian War. And then he founded a secondary city at Thessalonica. This was named for his wife, who was a member of the same family as Alexander, and therefore one of his claims to legitimacy. Well, in the event, Cassandria died out, and there are basically no remains there today. Uh, there are a few archaeological remains, but nothing that indicates that this was ever going to be a major center. However, Thessalonica remains strong throughout antiquity and the Middle Ages and continues to thrive to this very day. By 276, a new dynasty had emerged in Macedon, the Antigonids, and they would remain in power until the destruction of Macedon in 168. The major problem faced by the early Hellenistic rulers of Macedon was that there was some depopulation due to all of the men who had gone east with Alexander and never came home. Over time, they managed to make that up, but then another problem emerged. The Greeks of the south became much better organized, and every time that Macedon was on the verge of overrunning the entire Greek world, the rival kingdoms in the east would send money to the Greeks, and they would manage to fend off the Macedonians. The key mistake that the Antigonids made was joining Hannibal in fighting the Romans during the Second Punic War. Ultimately, the Romans were able to contain the Macedonian threat by utilizing the Aetolian League, 
but they did not forget that Philip V and his Macedonians had tried to take them out. So in 200, they fought a war with Macedon and won. Then later on, they fought another war with Macedon, which resulted in the destruction of the kingdom and it being broken up into various pieces. So Macedon was really the first Hellenistic kingdom to be destroyed, but not the last. And just like most of these guys, they would be destroyed at the hands of Rome. During the late Classical period, Athens and Sparta had found that it was very difficult for a single polis to try to take on a large territorial monarchy and win. The resource game just didn't favor a small polis. So, if you were a developing power at the time, you could take this lesson to heart and do something with it, and that is precisely what the Aetolian League did. Located in western central Greece, the Aetolians were effectively a small ethnic group that was mostly rural and poor. They didn't have very large cities. One thing they did have going for them, however, was a defensible home area with a great deal of mountainous terrain. So what they did is, late in the classical period or early in the Hellenistic period, they formed a solid alliance system amongst themselves. There were about 10 or 11 members. They had a common meeting place at Thermos, and they formed a shared army. This shared army, this league army, enabled them to improve the quality of their training and equipment, so they were able to model themselves after the Macedonian army, and they were then able to expand from there. At first, the Aetolians had a rather negative reputation because there were many bandits stationed in Aetolia, and a lot of people assumed that the League was largely a cover for those bandits, and perhaps that is true to an extent. However, what the Aetolians were also able to do was build an army that could win battles. And so, not only were they able to hold their own against the Macedonians and the Achaeans to the south, but they defeated a rogue king of Sparta who was on the loose, and they also defeated the barbarians who had overrun the oracle at Delphi. So they were able to gain a lot of gratitude with their fellow Greeks, and at one point they expanded outward from their Aetolian homeland into a great deal of central Greece, and they were a fairly important and respected power. They had been reduced a good deal by about 215 or so, and so when the Macedonians decided to declare war on Rome, Rome found a willing ally in Aetolia. For Rome, this was very convenient because they were up to their eyeballs in Hannibal problems, and so Aetolia basically fought and bled for Rome during the Second Punic War and held Philip V in the Balkans. In 200, Rome decided to avenge itself on Philip, and Aetolia joined in once again, and did a fair amount of fighting and bleeding. Rome did give the Aetolians some territorial winnings from the war, but Aetolia felt that it had been screwed over and shortchanged, and so they went looking for a new ally to humble the Romans, and they found the Seleucids. However, in this war, the Romans once again won, and this time they effectively neutered the Aetolian League, by preventing it from having any members who were not Aetolians, to say anyone outside of their mountainous homeland. And this move effectively, for all practical intents and purposes, killed the Aetolian League as a power. And really after about 192, we don't really hear anything else about the Aetolian League. And I'm not sure if anyone knows exactly when it ceased to exist. But it just kind of quietly fizzled out. It wasn't really destroyed in any dramatic fashion. But during its heyday in the 3rd century, it did terrorize many of its neighbors, and it was an effective counterbalance to the power of the Romans. Or not the Romans, but the Macedonians. In the northwest Peloponnese, just across the Saronic Gulf from Aetolia, was Achaea. Achaea was an area which had its own dialect, and much like Aetolia, it was somewhat rural and poor when compared to many other parts of the Greek world. During this classical era, it was largely just an ally of Sparta, which would furnish men for the Peloponnesian League army. But over the course of the classical period, it did have some developments and some growth. And eventually, the Achaeans would band together into the Achaean League. So at first, this was just an ethnic exclusive league, but over time, it came to be something more. And it came to incorporate many of its more powerful neighbors, including the cities of Corinth, Argos, and Megalopolis, which was the new city down in Messenia. 
which had once been under rule by Sparta. The Achaeans were definitely wealthier than the Aetolians, and they were organized in a fairly similar fashion. They had a league meeting, and they would elect a general and a leader of the cavalry, and they would switch leaders every year. The chief magistrates from each of the cities would meet together in a kind of council for the whole of the Achaean League, and they would make decisions. The Achaeans, more so than the Aetolians, were really able to threaten Macedonian control of Greece, and some of their more notable victories included taking out some of the major fortresses that the Macedonians relied upon to maintain control of the Greek south. Sparta, however, actually did manage to upset a lot of the progress of the Achaeans. Sparta never actually went away. But what they would do is they would sit and bide their time, and then they would emerge and try to reclaim their former glory. All of these attempts ultimately ended in failure, but not before they caused a lot of noise. And so Sparta was actually a balancing factor which helped to hold back the Achaeans. And that's actually their chief significance in the Hellenistic period, I would say, is the damage that they dealt to the Achaeans and preventing them from really managing to shift the balance of power against the Aetolians and Macedonians in a permanent way. In 200, when the Romans arrived to gain their revenge on the Macedonians, the Achaeans threw in their lot with Rome and became ardent allies thereafter. They also participated in the Third Macedonian War, which resulted in the destruction of Macedon in 168-167. However, as was often the case, Rome began to suspect their ally after the war because the Achaean League maintained an army. They weren't too keen on that. They actually took a whole bunch of hostages from Achaea after the war because they didn't trust them. One of those hostages was a high-ranking nobleman named Polybius, who would have become the general of the Achaean League in just a few years had he remained. He became a famous historian who wrote about Rome's rise, and ultimately he would chronicle the destruction of the Achaean League at the hands of Rome. Now, he seems to have suffered from some pretty severe Stockholm Syndrome by the end of his life, and so he actually blamed the war on the Achaeans, although it's very clear that it was Rome's suspicion of any power that had an army that was responsible for the destruction of the Achaean League. The Romans completely destroyed the city of Corinth, and then dissolved the League. Polybius, according to himself, was able to make sure that the terms were more lenient. But, again, the, the war was definitely the fault of the Romans. They made an ultimatum to the Achaeans for no particular reason. They needed to disarm. And the Achaeans effectively said no because this was unprovoked. They'd always been a good ally. But Rome had other ideas. And so the Achaean League met its end around the 140s or so. Long one of the most prosperous parts of the Greek East, and lying strategically off the southwest coast of Asia Minor, the island of Rhodes was very much fought over in the early successor period. Rhodes had three major cities, and it was great for both commercial purposes and also for helping to control the sea lanes of the eastern Aegean. After fending off challenges by a number of successor powers, and no most notably a major siege attempt by Demetrius the Besieger, the Rhodians effectively gained their independence and became one of the greatest naval and commercial powers of the eastern Mediterranean, able to maintain their independence against both the Macedonians and Ptolemy's Egypt. The Colossus of Rhodes was built to commemorate their great victory over Demetrius, and this was a statue of the god Helios, the sun god, and he was either standing prominently over the harbor, or perhaps they even built the statue where he had two legs straddling between two different harbors over an open area of water. Either way, the Colossus of Rhodes was one of the wonders of the ancient world, and it was a mammoth statue. Eventually, it would collapse, and it would collapse back into the streets of the city of Rhodes itself, and apparently they just kind of left the pieces laying in the streets for many years. But when it stood, it was impressive, and it could be seen from the sea for many, many miles. Rhodes also developed culturally quite a bit, 
and it became one of the greatest centers of learning in the ancient world, especially for students of rhetoric. The great Roman orator Cicero actually learned to speak here. The Rhodians, the teachers, taught him how to speak at length without exhausting his voice, which is quite a task, I have to tell you, as someone who does a lot of lecturing. Um, I wish I could go to Rhodes and learn that trick, because speaking for long periods of time can definitely take your voice to the limit. Rhodes eventually lost its independence because it didn't threaten Rome in any way, but it did offend Rome because they said that the Third Macedonian War was unnecessary. So the Romans were sufficiently offended that they then went to Rhodes a few years later and demanded that the Rhodians disband their fleet. Rhodes had a fairly modest-sized fleet by this point because they weren't really competing for dominance, just defense. But one of the things the Rhodian fleet did because they were a commercial power is that they fought pirates. So they helped to make sure that commerce was safe for merchants. Well, once the Rhodian fleet is gone from the seas and Rhodes is just another ally of Rome, Rome does not pick up the slack navally and so piracy will grow and abound to the point that about a hundred years later the Romans will have to develop a special command to fight pirates across the Mediterranean because piracy will have grown so dramatically out of control. So, uh, just as a preview for when we talk about the Romans, uh, one of their characteristics is that they destroy a whole lot of things and sometimes don't think through the ramifications of their conquest and their actions. And now we move on to our first Hellenistic kingdom in the proper sense. The first kingdom that we'll look at was Pergamon. Pergamon was founded by a minor Macedonian nobleman named Philoteros. Philoteros became a eunuch because of a childhood accident where an animal stepped on his testicles and crushed them, and so because of that he was never able to have children, but he still used his rank to serve as an officer. He served under a number of the major successors, including Antigonus the One-Eyed and Lysimachus, before coming to serve under Seleucus I. After he went to Seleucus I, he struck a deal with him and basically traded in his treasury, which had about 9,000 talents, which is an immense sum, in order to gain his independence. And so he founded what was, at the time, more or less just the city of Pergamon itself. Now, this city already existed, but now it was ruled by Philoteros. After he died, it went to his nephew, who then founded a dynasty called the Adelid Dynasty, and it was under the third ruler, Attalus I, that the Pergamenes controlled enough territory that they could declare themselves to be kings in a meaningful sense. Pergamon was one of the few Hellenistic kingdoms which both interacted with Rome and came off better for it. They allied themselves with Rome to fight the Seleucids during the war between Rome and Antiochus III. This resulted in massive gains for Pergamon in 188 at the Treaty of Apamea. And after that period, the Pergamene kings would control enough territory that they were able to start building monumental architecture in Pergamon itself, which up to this point had been a fairly modest city. So now they're able to basically build their own version of the Athenian Acropolis. They actually tried to recreate that in Pergamon itself. And we'll take a look at that in just a minute because it's still pretty impressive looking even though it is in an advanced state of uh, disrepair. The Pergamenes also invested in a massive library based on the one at Alexandria and apparently got to the point where their library was the second biggest in the world at one point. When the last of the Pergamene rulers, that is to say the last of the Adelaide dynasty, died without an obvious heir, he decided to bequeath his entire realm to the Roman Republic in the year 133 BCE. And so the kingdom of Pergamon was also part of Rome now, although it is worth noting that it was given to the Romans peacefully, which is quite unusual, actually, because almost everything else the Romans acquired was by force and bloodshed after they came up with some ridiculous reasons why the, the other side had started the war. Here's what the Acropolis of Pergamon looks like today. As you can see, in its heyday, this must have been extremely impressive. There's a large temple in the foreground, and as you look up at the Acropolis, 
they clearly had an entire complex comparable to what was at Athens. You can see on the lower slopes that there are buildings, which must have been something like an entranceway. And as you move up, you see there are more structures, including some temples at the very top. But unfortunately, this has not been well preserved, despite being a fair amount newer than the Athenian Acropolis. And so we don't really know a whole lot about what was at Pergamon in terms of the buildings there. And again, this is very unfortunate, because clearly it was quite impressive and interesting in its heyday. Next up is a unique Hellenistic kingdom insofar as it was not formed by a successor of Alexander in a direct sense, but rather by someone who was inspired by Alexander's conquest and lived in close enough proximity to imitate him. Zapoites was a major Thracian leader. He was a leader among the Thracians of Asia Minor, and although he was not directly impacted by Alexander's conquest, he did take careful note, and while Alexander was still king, ascended to power, founded a city named for himself, Zapoitian, and became the first king of Bithynia. He also pushed hard to Hellenize his people, so they began to try to put aside their Thracian culture and embrace Greekness. And for the most part, they actually did that. In many Hellenistic kingdoms, the level of Greekness that the people would adopt was fairly superficial, largely limited to the upper classes, and in many cases limited mostly to language. But in Bithynia, the conversion to Greekness was pretty thorough. So Zapoites would have children and grandchildren who would have Greek names, and it looks like pretty much all of the Thracian citizens would also take up Greek names. So this level of Hellenization was pretty deep. Bithynia would come to control the entirety of Northwest Asia Minor in the fullness of time. Zapoites' successor, Nicomedes I, was able to restore the old Greek city of Nicomedia in 264, and then he made this his capital. The city was called that before he arrived, by the way. He did not actually name the city for himself, but the name is a nice coincidence, so just so we're clear on that. Later on, Nicomedes IV, who ruled from 94 to 74, was mostly famous not only for being the last of the Bithynian kings, but for supposedly being a pretty notorious, lecherous old man. And one of his supposed conquests was a young Gaius Julius Caesar, who visited as a junior envoy. And this would lead to many, many jokes at Caesar's expense for years, including the jibe by Cicero that Caesar was every man's woman and every woman's man. Eventually, as he aged and had no clear heir, Nicomedes IV would decide to follow the example of Pergamon and bequeath his kingdom to the Roman Republic. That actually would end up then leading to a major war with Mithridates that would take Rome over a decade to win. So this was not exactly a free land gift, but still, it was something that would ultimately benefit the Roman world. As for the city of Nicomedia itself, this was a city which was really destined to go on to do great things. It was very important during the Roman imperial period as a major center, and especially during the Byzantine period when the Byzantines were at their low ebb and when they were struggling to hold the line against the massive Arab invasions, Nicomedia was a major organizational center from which they were then able to restore a lot of their empire and manage to survive the majority of the Middle Ages. So Bithynia did play a indirect but important role in Western history in that way. Moving south across the Mediterranean, we arrive at Ptolemaic Egypt. Ptolemaic Egypt was founded by Alexander's general Ptolemy and all of its rulers. The males were pretty much all named Ptolemy and the majority of the females were named Cleopatra. So Ptolemaic history can have a lot of name repetition. Ptolemaic Egypt was set up in a fairly different way when compared with most of the other successor kingdoms. For starters, Ptolemy was unique in the sense that he does not seem to have really had any grand ambition of uniting all of Alexander's empire. Instead, he wanted to go his own way, control Egypt, have a strong navy, and then control some outlying areas such as Cyprus, the Levant, so basically what is now Israel and Palestine and part of Syria, 
and then also have some interest on the south coast of Asia Minor, but basically have those just to keep all of his other enemies at bay to defend the Egyptian homeland. So in effect, what he was creating was something that was more or less a reproduction of New Kingdom Egypt. In terms of how he ran Egypt, he also did something completely opposite to all of his competitors. Whereas most of the other Hellenistic kingdoms settled down Greek colonies and encouraged the locals to adopt Greek ways, Ptolemy did not encourage the Egyptians to Hellenize. In fact, he seems to have banked upon the fact that they wouldn't. And that's kind of what he wanted. He only wanted Greeks and Macedonians to have political power and to bear arms. So they were effectively the military and political class of Egypt, and he would settle them along the Nile at strategic points, mostly, of course, at Alexandria, which we'll get to, but also at other strategic points on the Nile. And then the locals, their job was both to practice their native religion and their native customs, which Ptolemy thought was important, but also to produce wealth and do the legwork. So, in many ways, Egypt was set up to be a giant plantation with the Greeks as overseers and the Ptolemies as the masters. The Ptolemies would put out propaganda that was in the style of the pharaohs, so they would pose as pharaohs. And, for the most part, they were able to keep the locals fairly content. Not to say that there wasn't some resentment, but for the most part, the locals were not too rebellious. One exception to this is when, during a crisis around 217, the Ptolemies actually did arm a bunch of native Egyptians to fend off a Seleucid invasion, and then the natives revolted, so the Ptolemies decided never to make that mistake again. However, because of the constant threat of the locals rising up if they weren't sufficiently garrisoned, Ptolemaic Egypt was never able to mount serious threats to its neighbors. So in many ways, you could also think of it as the Sparta of the Hellenistic world in the sense that its foreign policy was governed by the need to keep a significant army at home at all times. So it was never a huge threat to a lot of its neighbors, and rather than fighting them directly, if at all possible, what the Ptolemies would do would be to send money to, in order to get proxy wars fought on their behalf. So if Macedon was starting to get a little too strong, the Ptolemies would send money to the Achaean League or the Aetolian League or the Athenians or the Spartans to get them to fight and keep the Macedonians in check. They did the same thing to the Seleucids and others. So they used their economic power to make up for their lack of military power and they tried to prevent wars from being fought close to home because the natives could revolt if they had a sufficient opportunity. They were kept just happy enough to keep them working so long as there was no easy way for them to break away. So that is Ptolemaic Egypt in a nutshell, basically a plantation arranged by Ptolemy, and when the Romans will eventually acquire this after the defeat of Cleopatra in 31, basically they just look at this arrangement and they say, this works for us, but now the master of Egypt will be the Roman emperor, and that will be his personal slush fund to pay the legions. Although Greek settlers were all along the Nile and many small communities, the majority of the Greeks settled at Alexandria. Alexandria was named for Alexander the Great, and indeed, Alexander had selected the site himself when he visited Egypt early in his campaigns. Ptolemy seems to have really loved this site, and for him, this was the Alexandria, and so he made sure that it was the Alexandria for everyone else as well. Alexander actually started about 60 or so cities named Alexandria, but we only remember one, and there's a reason for that. Ptolemy, to make sure that this city was properly the Alexandria, even went so far as to abduct Alexander's body from his funeral procession and build a grand tomb for him in Alexandria. That tomb and the body are long lost, but in its time, this made Alexandria a very prestigious place. Alexandria would now become one of the great cities of antiquity and also the capital city for Ptolemaic Egypt. The museum was an institution designed to house scholars in all kinds of different fields. It functioned largely like a modern university except that instead of having permanent students, anyone who wished could visit the museum and consult with the top scholars on various issues and these scholars would basically hold something like office hours in order to meet with the public, and then they would do research. 
the library was a part of the museum and this would be where they would house all the manuscripts and they ultimately would amass the greatest manuscript collection the world had seen to that point. The lighthouse at Pharos was built in order to guide ships into the harbor as was considered one of the wonders of the world and it helped Alexandria to become extremely prosperous and to grow into the mega city that it became. In fact, at one point, Alexandria might have had up to half a million inhabitants, which for ancient standards was massive. The scholars at Alexandria, among many, many other things, managed to create a numbering system that you could use to denote passages in ancient text. If you've ever read Herodotus or Thucydides, you know that you can look up a book and then look up a chapter and sometimes a verse, and that will help you to find a specific part of the text. Well, that kind of numbering system was developed here at Alexandria, and this numbering system applied to pretty much every ancient text up until the invention of modern books. Alexandria, despite being primarily a center for governing Greeks, was also a diverse city which had other ethnic neighborhoods. It was very segregated, however, and there were ethnic tensions in Alexandria. Other neighborhoods included a large Jewish quarter and a large quarter for the native Egyptians. Many of the Jewish settlers here were fairly prosperous merchants and did pretty well. Some of them Hellenized to a large extent. And in fact, there were some pretty intense debates on religion between the early Greek-speaking Christians and the Hellenized Jews. So they would debate what the Old Testament meant and some other things like that. As for the native Egyptian inhabitants, these were sort of more of the working class of the city. These were the guys who would clean the streets and all of that. They lived in the poor sections of town, worked at the dockyards and all of that kind of stuff. So Alexandria was a very lively place. It had a lot of crime. There were a lot of riots, a lot of ethnic tension, but one thing that Alexandria never was, was boring. So that is always something. The library at Alexandria, by the way, burned down during the early Middle Ages, and we don't know exactly what was lost here. There are some scholars who now think that almost all the texts have been removed by that point because the building was in bad disrepair, but no one knows for sure. And this is also a very speculative reconstruction of what it might have looked like. We actually have no idea because the remains of it are so scanty. And it's hard to do archaeology in Alexandria for a couple of reasons. One, because it's in the Nile Delta, which has a lot of silting. And two, because it, is, it has been a continuously inhabited city ever since it was founded by Ptolemy I. And now let's look at the largest and most powerful of the successor states, the Seleucid Empire. Of all the successors, the man with by far the best chance of unifying the whole of Alexander's empire was Seleucus I. A close contemporary of Alexander, he was old in 281, but he had just defeated the king of Macedon Lysimachus, and he had united pretty much all of Alexander's old empire outside of Pergamon, which he had just donated to Philoteros, and Egypt, which was now under Ptolemy II. But as he was on the cusp of total victory, he was then assassinated. And so that brought that to a screeching halt. This allowed for Macedon to go its own way, for Greece to retain its independence, and for a couple other powers to spring up, including Bithynia. But Seleucus was very, very close, probably within three to four years of completely reunifying all of the Alexandrine Empire. The Seleucid realm would remain the largest in the Hellenistic world for quite a while. Seleucus and his successors were able to retain most of what had been the Achaemenid Persian Empire, and for the most part, they did not very much alter the satrapies and military arrangements of Persia. The only main difference is that rather than having a military core of Persians and Medes, it would now be a core of Macedonians and Greeks, with then ethnic contingents coming from different nationalities around the empire. The main force that would eventually tear the Seleucid Empire apart was the rising of ethnic independence movements around the empire itself and then external pressure from powerful neighbors. The Seleucids were spread pretty thin, and despite getting a large number of Greek settlers, there just weren't quite enough, and they didn't do enough to try to integrate some of the other ethnic groups into the ruling class in order to have a sufficient manpower pool. 
In Judea, we won't get into that very much, but the main driving force of the independence movement was a reaction against Hellenization. A lot of the traditional the, the traditionalists there believed that Hellenization was a big threat to traditional Judaism, and so that sparked a massive revolt and resulted in the formation of the Hasmonean Kingdom. In Parthia, they were effectively neighbors of the old Persians, and they decided to play Persian identity politics and restore something that claimed to be the true successor to Persia. And then Parthia especially would continue to grow and chomp away at parts of the Seleucid Empire. The real death blow was probably struck when Antiochus III the Great was in power, however. He was able to restore a lot of the empire's standing in the early years of his reign. However, he then had a lot of that undone in a single blow when he was defeated by the Romans at the Battle of Magnesia in 190 and then forced to sign the Treaty of Apamea in 188. This took away all of the gains he'd made in Asia Minor. His son, Antiochus IV, tried some other stuff to restore the empire's standing, but those things failed and in fact inspired the Hasmonean Revolt, among other things. So the Seleucid Empire entered a long period of decline and it was eventually reduced a little more than the city of Antioch and its suburbs. It was then temporarily snuffed out by Armenia in 83, and Armenia at this time was not a huge power, so that tells you how far the Seleucids had fallen. It was then actually restored by Antiochus XIII in the year 69, only for it to then be destroyed yet again by the Roman general Pompey the Great, who simply arrived in 63 and said, Seleucid, you're done. It's over. This is pathetic. I'm putting an end to it. And so the Seleucid Empire died with a whimper. But um, this was still a very impactful empire in its time, and it did found a number of cities, most of which faded away, but a couple of them are pretty noteworthy, so let's talk about those right now. Despite the fact that we now associate the Seleucid Empire primarily with Syria, its origin was in what is now Iraq, and this was the place where Seleucus really got his start in terms of when he began to become prominent, and this was also the place that he intended to place his capital. He built a city called Seleucia on the Tigris near Babylon, and this was probably supposed to be his original capital for the entire empire. Most likely, had he conquered the entirety of Alexander's old empire, this would have been where he would have cited the capital of the empire as a whole. This would have been where he would have retired, built his grand tomb, and all of that. The city was built on a massive scale. And because it got a lot of imperial tribute throughout its existence, this induced many neighboring people to move from Babylon, which was right next door, into Seleucia. We don't have much of the city left anymore. But we do know just enough to know that it once covered a massive area and housed a very large population. What you see on the screen is where the theater was located. Eventually, however, after the Parthians took over this region, it could no longer be the capital for the Seleucids, and so it began to fade in significance. It was still settled for a long time, though. One of the reasons why it started to lose ground is because the Parthians put yet another city in this area called Ctesiphon, which then drew away settlers from Seleucia and also from Babylon. So Ctesiphon would grow to be the next great center, and that would leave Seleucia weak. Because it was weaker and less well defended and maintained, this would be a place that the Roman generals who would invade could take. So the Roman Emperor Trajan destroyed the city in 117, and a Roman general crushed the city again in 165 CE, but the Parthians rebuilt it at least in part, and the city would remain inhabited on some level until the Tigris shifted course and left the area as a desert that no one wanted to live in. So at that point it lost its strategic and commercial significance and was buried by the sand. Early in his reign, Seleucus thought that Syria was exposed and something of a weak point. He wanted to shore this up. Despite being part of the Fertile Crescent, Antioch had never really had that many major cities outside of its coastal areas where you had some Phoenician settlements. And so he decided to build four different, fairly major, well-fortified cities in order to protect his new 
area from Lysimachus to the north and Ptolemy to the south. One of these four was named Antioch. Now Seleucus was a little different than Alexander in the sense that when he named cities, he not only named some of them after himself, but he named some after his close relatives. Antiochus was the name of both Seleucus' father and his son, and so there were quite a few Antiochs around the empire as well. Antioch on the Orontes was most likely not intended to be the chief city of Syria, and it certainly was not intended to be the chief city of the Seleucid Empire. But it would in time become both of those things, and in fact when we think of the Seleucid Empire, we now think of it as being a Syrian empire, and we think of it as being centered around Antioch. But Antioch only became the center of the Seleucid Empire over time. So it was not entirely by design that Antioch became great, because originally Seleucus sent only 5,300 initial settlers to create the city, and it seems to have been mostly defensive in purpose as it sits at the foot of the Taurus Mountains and is not connected to trade the way that Seleucia on the coast is, where it was basically at the site of a Phoenician city and would have obvious trade routes. But over time, history favored Antioch. It was more defensible because it was on higher ground, so it was, e it was easier to defend, harder to destroy. It had good farmland around it, so it was able to feed a fairly large population. The Orontes was a good navigable river that could help with commerce, defense, and keeping the place well watered. And once the Silk Road emerges, guess what? Antioch is the western terminus point. So Antioch would remain very prominent and important for a very long period of time, and a lot of that was just sheer luck. In many ways, Antioch is to Seleucus what Thessalonica was to Cassander. It was not intended to be a huge settlement, but it ended up becoming extraordinarily important. Under the Romans, Antioch would, if anything, become even more important. For, for Rome, Antioch at one point was its third city, and uh, either third or fourth, depending on how you do the counting. I guess after the establishment of Constantinople, it moves down to fourth, but up to that point, it's about the third most important city in the empire. It would retain a lot of importance under the Byzantines, at least for a time. It would be the capital of a crusader state. Um, Antioch would be massively important in subsequent history. Uh, under the Romans, it also had a massive school of rhetoric. It had one of the most powerful early church organizations. Um, Antioch became incredibly important both politically, culturally, and economically. Well, I said both, and I listed three things, but you know what I meant, okay? I'm not re-recording this because uh, of one minor error, so we just have to live with that, and we're going to move on. And now we move on to one of the most curious stories in the Hellenistic period, the story of the Greco-Bactrian kingdom and its spin-off, the Indo-Greek kingdom. During Alexander's campaigns, he hired a large number of Greek mercenaries. The Persians had also hired a great number of Greek mercenaries to fight against him, and he would then take those men into his service when he defeated the last Persian king. These men were useful to serve as garrisons, especially as Alexander marched deeper and deeper east. And so, after his brutal campaign in Bactria, today's Afghanistan, Alexander had established some fairly significant garrisons in the east, mostly of Greek mercenaries. Upon his death, many of these mercenaries began to pine for home, and they wanted to go back to the Mediterranean. It's cold and dry in, in Afghanistan. It's nothing like the Mediterranean, and they were sick of it. So they wanted to go home. They tried to march home, but then one of the successor generals met them in battle, defeated them, and forced them to go back to Bactria. So they would serve here, and they would be part of Seleucus' empire for a while, but then in 256, the satrap Diodotus revolted, declared himself king, and gained independence for Sogdiana, which is to the north of modern Afghanistan, and then Bactria, and declared himself king of an independent Bactria, which we today call the Greco-Bactrian kingdom. His dynasty was then usurped by a man named Euthydemus, and Euthydemus's main uh, accomplishment was fending off an invasion by Antiochus III the Great around 210. So even though he did revive Seleucid power, he was not able to oust the independent monarchs of Bactria. Uh, 
In order to preserve and enhance their Greek culture in this far-flung place, the Greek cities in the Greco-Bactrian kingdom often would put, as a kind of, of literary graffiti on their buildings, lengthy quotes from various famous Greek authors. So you'd have long Plato and Thucydides and Aristophanes quotes on the walls of buildings. This is very, very unusual, and it shows that they were very insecure about their heritage in this far-flung island of Greek culture. Elsewhere in the Greek world, and also in the Roman world, most graffiti was either about a place where someone had been, so yes, the so-and-so was here, graffito, was extraordinarily common in antiquity. Also, people would talk about prostitutes that they were interested in, gladiators and athletes, they'd talk about um, bowel movements. Most, graf most graffiti was fairly vulgar, but in the Greco-Bactrian kingdom, this was some high-level graffiti, because this was graffiti of literary merit. And it served the purpose of reminding people there that they were, in fact, Greek, and they needed to preserve their culture and their heritage. Despite being isolated and then eventually cut off, especially once the Parthian kingdom emerges, the Greco-Bactrian kingdom managed to actually expand to the east without any help from the other Greeks. In 180 or so, the Greco-Bactrian kingdom reached its peak as it overran much of what is today Pakistan. And then a civil war broke out, and after that civil war, you had two kingdoms that emerged. The one in the east would become the Indo-Greek kingdom, and it surprisingly, despite being on less defensible terrain, and despite being much newer, would end up massively outlasting the original Greco-Bactrian kingdom, which actually ended up succumbing to stronger neighbors around 100 BCE. Most of what we know about both the Greco-Bactrian and Indo-Greek kingdoms comes to us from the Greek writer Justin, who only seems to have some very vague accounts that came from the Far East. So we don't really know as much as we'd like to, but based on the archaeology of the Indo-Greek kingdom, we know that this one had probably the most interesting history of any of these states, if only we just knew more of it. Originally splitting off from the Greco-Bactrian kingdom during that civil war back in 180 BCE, this kingdom was now located in what is mostly Pakistan today. This was never a major political force, however, so the Indo-Greek kingdom did have a period where it was prosperous, but it was never in control of a huge area, at least not for a very long period of time. Its political power was broken relatively early on, and then it survived as a small independent area. One of the most notable features about the Indo-Greek kingdom is that it managed to continue to mint very Greek coins while at the same time the rest of its material culture became very much syncretic. It began to look like a strange mix of Greek and Indian culture. And a lot of that was because there is a kind of fusion between Greek culture and Buddhism that occurred during this period in this area. And this led to lots of new religious ideas and art styles. So this was a fascinating time period and place to be because you had a mix of all of the old Greek traditions of, say, Plato and Aristotle with the ideas of Indian civilization. And you would have, say, Indian-style temples, but with then Corinthian columns. I mean, a lot of neat stuff was going on at this time, and it's a shame that there's not more information available about the Indo-Greek kingdom. It also is very interesting to note that, technically speaking, this is the last Indo this is the last Hellenistic kingdom which survived. Ptolemaic Egypt was conquered in 31 BCE after the Battle of Actium, and the Indo-Greek kingdom would last for 40 more years. So this far-flung island of Greek culture, which then had this interesting ending where it kind of meshed and blended with Buddhism in the East, was the last bastion of Alexander's conquest. So fascinating to think about, and I can only hope that as time goes on, more archaeological work will be done in Afghanistan and Pakistan to uncover some of the remains of the Eastern Greeks, because this is some fascinating stuff.
And I wish I could give you some more recommended readings on this topic, but unfortunately there is very little out there to look up for this topic. Um, like I said, I guess we can all hope that in the future more things will become available. But that is it for the Hellenistic period. And now it is time for the power that killed pretty much all of the Hellenistic powers, Rome.